Do we need an update on the toe? <laughs> an update on the toe. Not to be too gross, but there is this pin sticking out of the end of my toe. And yeah. I, I guess it, they sort of capped it with this little yellow plastic thing. Uh-huh. And the other day I realized that thing had fallen off. <gasps> and I, I, I had to say to Desmond, can you look on the floor and see if you can see the little plastic thing Whoa. that fell off the end of my toe? Yes. Ooh, that was kind of actually his reaction. But he found it. <laughs> oh, good, good, good for him. <laughs> and we stuck yeah. it back on the end of my toe. <laughs> this is yeah, my life these days. <laughs> Bless his cotton socks. I'm sure he didn't realise he was going to have to do that when he signed up to be devoted husband. I believe those were actually his words. <laughs> oh, too too funny. So anyway, back to the podcast. I'm Sarah Ferrison. And I'm Catherine Reynolds. The Impromptu Game Plan, the book and the podcast are a series of conversations with people about their career journeys and how they've managed to align their strengths, their experiences, their passions and values to create more meaningful careers. Today, we are talking to someone who I worked with 21 years ago. And I know it was well more than 21 years ago. I know it was that long ago because I found out that I was pregnant with Anya not long after starting there. And Anya, as everybody knows, just turned 21. So I met Eric 21 years ago. We both worked for Viacom. And you've stayed in touch all of that time, or have you just re-found each other in well, the career sense recently? It was quite a tight-knit group that worked in this part of Viacom. We were called Viacom Interactive Services, Viz. And we've actually done a few uh, reunions over the years. And in fact, the first reunion we did was my second date with Desmond. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that is so charming. Oh, that is lovely, Sarah. And then we did another reunion, probably literally before COVID hit and lockdown struck. (laughs) So anyway, Eric's always been a pretty passionate technologist. It was a sort of technology-related group in, in Viacom around their internet services. And he's done a bunch of really interesting things, which uh, I'm looking forward to talking to him about. Yeah, I can't wait to hear all about it. His um, his profile on LinkedIn looks absolutely amazing. It is. So- Welcome, Eric. Thank you for joining us. So it seems like a million years ago when we mm-hmm. were all so young. So really, where's a good place for you to start? I mean, how would, what have brought you to Viacom? Where does your story start for you? That's a good question. To, to start off just with the general understanding, my background is technology. I, I went to school as an electrical engineering person. Uh, com- back in the day, electrical engineering and computer science in my school were one major they hadn't yet differentiated. Uh, but I was the one person in engineering classes, well, probably that didn't like it, but also B, that tried to take as little as I could uh, just to meet the requirements to get the degree. But I spent most of my time in either creative writing or art history or <laughs> <Really>? filmmaking. Yeah. <laughs> Things like that. Um, and I and I fondly remember this one art history class I was taking that was about the Renaissance and, and mannerism. And and uh, there were six people in it, mostly other than me, graduate students. And the teacher was like, oh, just so I understand the, the body of the class, tell me what languages you speak <laughs> so that I can assign, you know, and, and of course the person next to me is like, oh, you know, Latin, French, German. You know? And I'm like, well, you know, does, does Fortran count? Because... <laughs> um, but so I spent a lot of my time doing that. So, so, I, so I, let, let me ask you. So why did you do an electrical engineering degree? Why didn't you I, do a history degree? Oh, well, I don't like history. Oh, well, you know what one, I mean? I think I was probably just swayed by the prospect of potential earned income afterwards. You know, like drilled into you, get a job that, you know, is a career that can support family, blah, 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 blah. And so I liked aspects of it. I was, I'm, I'm decent at math and sciences, and it seemed like a natural thing. I, I'm not chemistry per se or biology, so that seemed like a natural thing. And I gravitated certainly toward the computer science aspects of the combined degree. So my degree is computer science slash engineering, but as my school added more and more classes in the computer science aspects of it, that, that became more entertaining to me because it was much more, in my mind, uh, creative. And so that's where sort of the confluence is the the creative aspects of technology. Mm-hmm. So so it so even my first job out out of school or the second one that the first one that actually mattered uh, for Merrill Lynch, my job there was to similar to Viacom in a way, looking at new technologies and going, you know how we can use this 
<laughs> this way. So, so I always gravitated toward a creative use of technology, not technology for the sake of it. So, so that said, that led to various things like interactive television and post Viacom. But at Viacom, even when I started there, it was much more network infrastructure, which was all still had its challenges and its creative ways to link things together in the different buildings through fiber optics and and backups with microwave, and that was kind of neat. But when the opportunity presented itself to work with this interactive services group, it was much more on the working with the creative side of the house. And I'd often said to myself, certainly, uh, I think it's true, that if you're going to work for the, like Nabisco, it would be great to work for the Oreos. You know? yeah. like, I want to participate to what the company is doing, that the product is doing. I mean, anybody can be an accountant in any company, but are you really part of the company you know a yes maybe it makes you more transferable in your job but b i i, I wanted to feel like i was contributing so when the opportunity to work with viz came up uh for various ways uh you know oh this project you can do something with nickelodeon this project you can do something with mtv that was a great outlet for oh let me take this and mix it together and oh look at the creative things we can do and then working with the creative team to to enhance even further was was that so i always thought you had the coolest job at Viacom at Viz. I always looked at your job and thought, now that's a cool job. So what was your actual title there? Director of Technology Development okay. uh, was the actual title. I think that it, it shifted sometimes a little bit because there were some other parts of the company that had similar titles and we, we were always trying to keep a little bit under the radar for fear of being axed. <laughs> like, oh, that's what we do, even though no, nobody else really did what we did, obviously. But, yeah. um, but that was the official title. It was uh, keep abreast of new and burgeoning technologies, do some sort of assessment to find out if they had legs to stand on, find a creative way to deploy it and hopefully for for very low cost, build a prototype and then work with individual divisions within the company to say, hey, for, I mean, specific examples, hey, Sundance Channel for the film festival, you know, we've got this thing through real networks technologies that lets you broadcast out a unique thing, basically a podcast, you know, every <laughs> day. And, you know, so we put that together or, hey, VH1, we can do a multi-channel radio station online using this technology and this playlist thing. And and so forth and so on. So that's that was sort of it. So learning some new stuff, getting to meet basically you know entrepreneurs in that space, and then saying, oh yeah, let's uh, no promises, but we'll try to put together a little prototype. If it works, run with it. Or as or as Kathy uh, uh, Wilson used to say, you know the Zen water bearers. We'd sprinkle a little bit of water on it. If it grows, let it hopefully go off and burgeon in in the environment. So yes, yeah, it was yeah. a fun job because we were surrounded by creative people, technical people that had a creative bent, and even the business people. I mean, it was, a, it was a fun thing to do, you know, and it wasn't difficult to say, anybody want to go to lunch? Oh, sure. You know, and seven people would go. And yeah. it's, it's that sort of a thing that really felt much more family-like. And I think, which is why it was probably, you know, devastating to everyone when it ended. Of and Kathy was the perfect person to lead that group. And I think the reason we were all so happy is because she was so wonderful to work for. Yes. You know, Kathy had this wonderful little family in viz and and mm -hmm. we all loved each other and loved what we were doing and loved her but above us there was just all this politics swirling mm -hmm. around that company all the time Absolutely. and I, I suspect that to extents that none of us ever even realized she spent enormous amounts of her time trying to keep us all out of that politics yep. and keep those people away from exactly us. exactly yeah i picture a very harry potter like she's she erected this shield around us no i think it's exactly what she <laughs> did so how long were you with viacom and how long were you with um viz? i I think, I'm trying to remember now, I believe, well, so I started with Viacom as a consultant, actually. I was living in Baltimore, and I was working for, as a consultant for a company called CSC, Computer Science Corporation, and then they had it as an assignment, um, Viacom. So that's when I came up, and I put in the network infrastructure and did inventory of physically every single interconnected computer in the building. Oh my God. And that uh, was a big building. That was a big building. I literally was in every wiring closet, reaching in, tracing wires, oh going, okay, God. this this room connects to this port. And, um, and and I documented the whole thing. And then they offered me a job, um, and which I turned down because I had bought a house in Baltimore and all that kind of thing. Uh, but then they hired somebody else and I was I was still doing other projects. But I, I said to my wife, oh, we probably have about four months and they're going to re-offer me the job because this guy is not going to last. So they um, they did re-offer me the job when they got rid of him and then I took it that time. So then I, we moved up to New York, I guess, in 95 or 6 and worked there. And then I think I went to Viz in, uh, it might have been two, 99 or 98, something like that. So I was with Viacom itself for probably 9 or 10 years, something okay. like that. And then eventually even Kathy couldn't keep the forces of... <laughs> 
<laughs> destruction and politics away from us. Yes. And Viz was disbanded. Now, what year was that? That was, it was 2001. 2001. Yeah. You, along with everyone else in the group, mm -hmm. were let go. Correct. So, so what happened after that? Uh, so after that, it was a lot of soul searching and a lot of, uh, it was definitely more of a grief, you know, the seven stages. Yeah. or I think stage. we were all in grief. I yeah. mean, I remember at one point we had some meeting in a bar where we somehow thought that we were going to persuade Viacom, this right. huge organization, to take us, to all, take back. us all back. Yeah. <laughs> and even at the time, I'm like, yeah, I'm not sure that's going to work. Not, not gonna work. <laughs> After that, uh, I spent a long time just trying to figure out who, <laughs> who am I? <laughs> you know, you have a lot of self-doubts, like this is how I defined myself. You know what, now what? And how come all these people who said, oh, yeah, you're great, suddenly aren't responding to messages when it actually <laughs> needs to? Yeah. Be because that's that's because people stink is the reason for that. Um, but uh, and, and were you doing some that? When did you start the baking? Sort of uh, around that, then? I was around then. I was like, I need to do something. And um, I was out at a coffee house or a tea house. And uh, in a somewhat a potentially obnoxious way, I said to the owner, I said, your scones are not good. <laughs> If I could make them better, would you buy them for me? And they said, sure. So I did. So for about two years, um, I was baking and providing scones to about, well, A, online, uh, which is weird. Who'd buy them for me? But people did. And uh, locally to about five different like coffee houses. And then I expanded and was providing brownies and things to some restaurants and sort of at a tipping point. I got my, got my kitchen licensed so I could do it all legit. But after a while you realize, oh, I'm getting up at 4 a.m. You know, so I can bake as one does and deliver to the coffee houses before people commute and all that. And you know, like how much do you really make doing that out of your one oven and how many hours? And then I was offered a job doing some, uh, well, then I had, yeah, I think it was offered a job that was in the interactive television space. And so suddenly from making, you know, a dollar profit off of us, <laughs> suddenly it's like, oh, there's, it wasn't great salary, but it was like, oh, maybe that makes more sense to be back in that thing. But I think over the time I did it, I, conservatively, I, I know I've quoted myself as saying I did 18,000 scones in two years, something like that. So, but even if you make, you know, $2 a scone, that's not exactly yeah. <laughs> tons. So that was that. So then I, then I ended up working for this company that was based in Oregon for, but I was still in New York, obviously for um, interactive TV, which was a very interesting space for me because I had sort of dabbled in that a little bit, even at Viacom with the web TV from the Microsoft product and so forth. So after that, there was a, salesman with whom I, for whom I was uh, providing like tech support and assistance, he moved to a different company. He brought me with him to that company. But then after a while, for some reason on their part, they decided, oh, you're so good at this. You should be a salesperson. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> I am not a salesperson. Do not make me. So they made me a salesperson. And then shockingly, uh, I didn't meet their quota. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, they, they said, oh, you know, you're not, a, you're not good as a salesperson. So we're going to, we're going to. And you're like, I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I should have written this down. So then they let me go. <laughs> and uh, so then once again, I was doing my own thing. But but the idea of what I do uh, now um, had always been in the back of my mind. It was like, well, you know, maybe maybe now is the time, finally. Maybe the, the, the stars are in alignment saying you should focus on something of your own and not have to worry about people setting quotas for you <laughs> besides yourself and things of that nature. And so that, that's how I ventured into focusing more on what I did now. But of course, as luck would have it, as soon as that happened, someone else I know said, hey, we're doing, this was a company that does uh, sports analytics and data processing and for very large, like for the Olympics. And they were like, we could use somebody in the States to help us out as a consultant. So I was like, well, I'm not going to pass that down. <laughs> so I I ended up doing that. So of course my project got sort of waylaid again, but for a couple of years I was working at for them as a consultant, but managing relationships with the broadcast companies here for the Olympics and other sports venues and getting to travel to Italy a couple of times, which was also oh, that, a, a nice. That doesn't suck. That, that That is not a bad thing. Yeah. So, so that was good. And again, made some very good contacts, also a very, very great bunch of people. But then once that ended, <laughs> I was like, okay, I really need to focus. So then um, I started to do uh, what I do now, which is this audio guide uh, application for various cultural sites and activities, which again, it's a creative use of technology. It's And this idea actually came to me while I was at Viz, before smartphones. I was like, oh, there should, there should be a way. Because I remember I was on a business trip, even before Viz, I, I, I went to Dallas and the conference, the Cisco conference didn't start till, let's say Wednesday. We were there Tuesday. I was like, I'm going to go walk around. I've never been to Dallas, probably never coming back to Dallas. No offense to anyone who's in Dallas, but 
I've got a full day to, you know, to, to explore. And A, I'm cheap, so it's not like I'm going to go buy a guidebook, particularly for like three hours of walking around. B, uh, the concierge uh, it wasn't there. Uh, C, a lot of hotels have a magazine that's called Wear Magazine. Yeah. It, it turns out they're completely useless. Oh, they're, totally. Yeah, it's just ads. So I wandered around Dallas and I was like, oh, that, that's a really interesting, That there must be something <laughs> to tell about this sculpture or the, oh, that's the art museum. That's kind of cool. So I wandered in. And so then my mind was always like, you know, when you travel, you always have your wallet, you always have your keys, you always have your phone. So there should be a way on your phone to access all this stuff. And, and uh, people were a bit busy, but even when I reached out to a lot of these people, they're like, oh, great idea. When you're done, let me, let me know. I'm like, no, I, do, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to make that. So I did some mock-ups and worked with some people, but nothing, nothing, nothing. And then if you're really flash forward to 2012, uh, my town here in New York was having a bicentennial celebration. And as part of that, they decided to have a juried sculpture exhibit. And they had 26 sculptures coming for about six months. And I was like, well, that's that's kind of like kismet. I mean, that's a good application. So I reached out to the town and said, I had, I've had this idea for a long time. I think it'd be really great. It would be like... It would be like um, the artists could record their own voices and we could create a walking tour or a driving tour and they could be their own docents, if you will. And I never heard back from the town. Uh, uh, they, what they told me later was, oh, you know, it's our first bicentennial. We're overwhelmed. <laughs> so, um, so I then said, I don't think I need their permission. And so somewhere in the paper I saw, oh, they've selected these artists. So I started reaching out to the artists and I said, I'm doing this audio guide. And then I like, I drove to Manhattan and I recorded some guy on my iPad for two minutes and I drove back up and I drove up to Beacon, New York, which is also about 45 minutes from my house, recorded some woman, drove back down and so forth. And then I paid somebody to build an app based on my design. And then somewhere along the way, some artist said to the town, who is this guy and why is he calling me? And then the town reached out and said, who are you? I reminded them of the email I sent and that's when they apologized. And they said, oh, come meet. And they said, we'd love it. Uh, what what do you need from us? We think it's a great idea. We'll help you in any way possible other than financial. So I said, well, tell all the artists that I'm legit and those who I can't seem to find, could you at least give me connections? And they did. And so um, we built this app. It was a standalone app. Uh, it was only on Apple at the time. Uh, in 2013, I guess it launched. It ran effectively for six weeks, um, but it had great response. Um, it had 300 and something users, 45 minutes average user time, which I thought was great, 60% return usage. I even was able to bring in a restaurant and another restaurant and a nature preserve nearby. So they paid me to advertise in it. So I made $400, I think, <laughs> and spent 14000 but fine. It was close. And uh, But then I had a portfolio, if you will, yeah. of, of one item. And so then I'm like, well, maybe there are other cities in the country that do this. So I started Googling and I found some city in Ohio uh, that actually had trademarked the name, the city of sculpture. I was like, well, if anybody's going to need it, it's the city of sculpture. <laughs> so then they became my first customer in that regard. And then I flew out to Ohio and uh, met with these great people there. And they introduced me to a nearby sculpture park who were like, oh, we have no money basically. So I did a quick pivot and said, you know, maybe instead of an app for you and an app for you, maybe we do one app a la TripAdvisor, a la Yelp, where when you get to a place, it sorts by proximity. And in my mind, I'm thinking, hey, yeah, because any marketing the city does, you can leverage off that because you're right nearby and you'll be the next one down in the, in the geographic list. So, so in 2014, um, I relaunched with this collective uh, platform version of the app uh, with six guides at that time. And all six of whom are still customers, which is nice. And that was the sort of the uh, onset of the current thing, which to date, uh, closing my eyes to think for some reason, that I think we've done 280 different guides now across 170 different cities. So wow. in, in seven years, yeah. So so what is the app called? So, so the app, promote it. Absolutely. So the app is called Otocast, O-T-O-C-A-S-T. Uh, it's a free download for Apple and Android devices. The only it's anonymous, so there's no ads in it. Uh, the only thing it asks you is, can I use your location? Because again, it still does sort everything by where you are. The idea being, if you open up the app in New York, you'll see the New York guides first. You could scroll through, <clears throat> but if you take a trip to Dallas, <laughs> coincidentally, I have seven guides there. I think so. You can see 
oh, what's in Dallas? And that is what opens up first at the top of that list because that makes the most sense to do. The most recent one I just launched was up in the Berkshires uh, at, at uh, Edith Wharton's estate called The Mount. And so they have an annual sculpture exhibit. This one has, I think, 30 pieces. So on the website, they'll be promoting get the app, come hear it and so forth. But once you open up the app <clears throat> at The Mount, and then it knows that you're there, you'll see a map like a Google map uh, with pins representing each of the sculptures. And then you can see, of course, where you are, the blue dot. Not that this matters as much, but then you can get directions to those. But since it's all on the property, it doesn't make as much sense. But then as you take a walk and get closer to the dots, you can set this configuration. The audio will automatically start to play. Ah. So it's like being on a tour bus where yeah. suddenly you're passing, you know, Piccadilly Circus and so, oh, we're now in Piccadilly. So you, you can hear that. But for every, so in a general structure, the app is a collection of guides. The guides are a collection of points of interest, anywhere from one point of interest, because without one, then there's no need to be in yeah. there, uh, to as many as, as there need to be. And the whole idea is to have someone who knows what they're talking about, a voice of authority, if you will, explaining what it is that you're at. I am going to go so, and download this today. <laughs> yeah. Now, you're only doing it in the U.S. at this point? Um, it's mostly the U.S. In Canada, I think I have about seven or eight locations. And then New Brunswick, I have a number of things, um, one of which is coming very soon. We're doing an indoor guide for an aquarium using Bluetooth beacons because GPS indoors is not the most reliable. And particularly if you're doing different elevations, it doesn't work. Yeah. So we're putting Bluetooth beacons in there at this place called the Huntsman Aquarium, which is in St. Andrews, New Brunswick in Canada. And so once you get into a certain room, the app, you have to have Bluetooth on, the app will detect the beacon is there and go, oh, there's beacon number 78. You must be near the touch tank. And so you walk into the touch tank room and then you hear, you're now in the touch tank and so forth and so on. Um, and then as you go from room to room, we can activate the audio. And then I have one tour of London that, uh, that was a Dickens tour. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Uh, in Trieste, Italy, I do a guide of various historic sites and notable places in Trieste, which was done in conjunction with a company that does uh, uh, tours, basically. And they thought it'd be kind of neat for for that. They rent out segways, and that way you can do a self-guided oh, segway cool. tour. That's very cool. Segway tour, great. Yeah, segway Eric, um, there's, there's a couple of things actually pop, pop into my mind listening to you talk. I think what you're doing is just so exciting. We have in the, the UK, we have a city of culture mm -hmm. each year, and there are all sorts of installations mm -hmm. built to celebrate the culture of that, that particular city. And this year, year it's um, Coventry. Unfortunately, most of the installations have to be viewed um, virtually. But mm -hmm. I'm just thinking when, when we're not not virtual again this you know would just be an exceptional way to experience and um, the, the, the the city of culture well you mentioned the virtual tours a lot of uh, this past year a lot of people reached out to me just for that purpose they said we can't have people visit and we see this as a really good way to allow people to still appreciate it through a virtual tour now i remember when we did get together probably a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. you and I were talking about sort of what you might do next in terms of technology innovation. And we were talking about augmented reality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd done some work in it a few years ago. What, what What's the innovations for the, for the <laughs> technology going forward? Yeah, yeah. Well, one thing that, that, ha that came and went uh, as a small note was uh, Bose, the headphone company, they actually came yeah. out with, with oh, the that. glasses. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think pandemic and other things, they, they disbanded that aspect of it. But what they... Uh, what they still have are these sunglasses that have Bluetooth headphones built in. So they're actually pretty cool. But how I got involved was they also had built in to those glasses, a digital compass. So my app was able to read the direction. So unless you're wearing your glasses incorrectly, uh, in theory, we know what direction you're facing. And then we could spatially position the sound. So if you're walking up the street and off to your right is, let's say, a sculpture or, or a town hall or a surgical theater behind a door, you could hear, hey, look over here. And that sound emanates from that GPS location. That's a little creepy. It was, it was, <laughs> yes, but, but it was very cool. Uh, and then as you turn to look at it, we then go, oh, we now know you're looking at it because we know your direction. We know what angle you're looking and we know where it is. And then you could, uh, you were able to tap the side of the glasses frames and then the audio would start to play. So something I'm interested in, in is, you know, Catherine and I have been doing this work both on the podcast and for the book around how people have aligned or could align their strengths, their experiences, their passions, their values to create more meaningful, joyful careers for themselves. And, and it sounds like you have done this or you're at least 
on the right path to doing mm-hmm. this. Clearly, you managed to take your strengths and your experiences around technology, but around innovation, and you're very passionate around futuristic technology. Have you got any thoughts on, on where you've got to in that journey and where you might want to get to in that journey? I definitely think that I've gotten further into being happy. I really, I really enjoy doing this. I really enjoy speaking with all the artists and speaking with the townspeople and, and just being able to, I mean, sometimes I'm amazed, just like I was amazed that somebody in the middle of nowhere would have ordered, you know, baked goods from me sight unseen. Sometimes I'm amazed. It's like, wait, the city of X is trusting me for a guide for their entire public art collection. How does that work? You know, and they're they're printing up signs and they're putting, you know, it's like, really? So that just makes me very happy because for me, it's, it's also, it's always been about the relationship. There's a certain joy from that uh, and knowing that you are, well, at least to some degree, I think helping out these people and, and bringing things to it and, and educating people and working with the, the kid side of it and all that. And I mentioned earlier, I, I don't like history, but <laughs> when I listened to the history guide of the clop clop and going to the school, I'm like, that's just really interesting. <laughs> so one of the things we used the app for in the early days actually was a scavenger hunt in Boston, which was really neat. And so I like doing puzzles and games and, and uh, as you probably recall. Yeah. Um, and so uh, since I do write the puzzles for that NPR show still, I was able to reach out to that crowd and say, did anybody ever do a sort of a citywide? And like, of course, everybody's like, of course, what do you need? So, but we were able to work together on that. And I was able to bring in people from disparate parts of my existence and put together this scavenger hunt in Boston. That was really neat. So I, I mean, I'm very happy with what I'm doing. I mean, where do I see it going next? I mean, I, as you pointed out, most of the stuff I do is in the States. Uh, and in Canada, I have one person who helps me out as the sales agent in Canada. Where I, I'd love to expand more. But yeah, so so that's definitely a next step. I get the sense that if a big company, you know, if Viacom came along tomorrow and said, we'll buy it from you, Eric, that you probably wouldn't do that because it seems like the relationships and the local nature of it is where your values sit and where you get the joy. There, there's a small town-ness to, to mm-hmm. what your operations and how your interacting with these people that seems to be something that's meaningful to you. Is 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 that true? It, it's true to a degree. I mean, certainly the resources that a larger company would yeah. offer. So, so I would say if a large company in the space where I see I could add value, they could add value and let me still have as much as one can autonomy for a certain time period and and foster that. So if that could happen, that would be great. Yeah. So. I mean, it, it, it's interesting because you don't normally think of technology companies as being these relationship-based entities. Technology often feels actually the opposite of relationships to people. Mm -hmm. But you you seem to have found that sweet spot between the two, uh, which is great. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's why it's it's a tough thing. But I, for me, it's really important. I mean, again, I said I'm not a good, I'm not a salesperson, which I'm not. But for me, it's important to speak to somebody because someone says, oh, just send me information. It, it doesn't come through. You know, for me, it's important for them to hear the sincerity and, you know, talk to anybody uh, with whom I provide the service uh, because, you know, I'm, other than two instances, I'm thinking everyone who's ever signed on is still using it. People, six years, you know, ongoing customer, um, which has been great. And then expanding. I love talking to people. I love helping out people. And this has been neat and finding new ways to use it. And I tell people, oh, that's, you know what we could do? We, as long as it doesn't cost me money, yeah, just let me know. I'll, I'll be happy to try out things. Use it for three months. See if it works for you. There's analytics. You know, Do this, do that. Let's figure out how you could do it for no money. Let's get somebody to, to sponsor it. <laughs> Whatever I can do. So, so th- that does yes. lead me to sort of um, something that I've been thinking about as you've been talking. And we, and we have touched on this a little bit, but maybe you were just going there mm-hmm. before, which is you've always been this sort of futurist or, or to some extent, you know, technology innovator, new interesting ways of using technology. You've now got a stable business. Mm-hmm. To what extent do you feel the need to get back to that innovative way of being? And do you feel that this is a company that you're sufficiently able to do it in? And, and is there any tension there? Um, actually, no, I feel that this is very well positioned for that um, because Again, you mentioned augmented reality. Suddenly there's there's new things there. Spatial sound orientation, you know, there's there's that that I could certainly advance more of. Moving more into the indoor space and what does that mean? And then once you get indoors and you are using things like beacons, I know there are companies that do this, but now you could start to look at indoor navigation for visually impaired people. From the business aspect, as I mentioned, tying it into those larger scale 
trips and visits and hotel partnerships. So I, I mean, I think there's there's so much challenge intellectually, technically, that there's a there's a lot to grow on. I mean, it it almost seems like you've come back full circle to your viz days to doing these very interesting, exciting, interactive things, but now you're getting to do it for yourself without all the politics <clears throat> and nonsense that being part <laughs> of a, a large corporation was, which may be the best of all worlds. Yeah, no, uh, um, yes. Yeah, I've, uh, other than not having the, you know, financial resources <laughs> at your disposal. <laughs> I just have to say, Eric, this has been absolutely inspirational. I can't, I can't wait until there's there's a guide for for my city or where, wherever I'm going next. I, it's been great speaking with you, and definitely, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Eric. 